But yeah, throughout college, everyone always thought I was a CS major, even though I wasn't. Because I was always tinkering with computers and doing computer-related things. That is Ryan Brainerd, a principal member of technical staff over at Heroku. I'm Joshua Burke, a developer evangelist at Salesforce. And on the Salesforce Developer Podcast, you will hear stories and insights from developers for developers. Today, we have something of a special episode for you, as we're not here to discuss Ryan's current role at Heroku. Instead, we're going to talk a little bit about Salesforce history in the form of Workbench. While never an officially supported product, technically Workbench is an open source reference demonstration, it has seen a lot of use as something of a Swiss army knife for working in debugging on the Salesforce platform as new features have come up for both the platform and also added to Workbench. For this episode, I offer Ryan's interview nearly in its entirety. In fact, let's back up a little bit and hear what Ryan actually majored in college. I actually studied advertising. That's what my <laughs> final major was. Was that your plan to go into advertising? It was not. I went in actually in biological engineering. So I did engineering for a couple of years, then just realized my heart wasn't in it as far as uh, I think it was more with some of the classes and I started to get into art and other stuff and uh, other stuff in college. Uh, oh, I started sure. doing photography and painting and other things. And yeah, so I wanted something that I could kind of express myself creatively, but then also have, you know, some scientific backing. And I kind of landed on advertising, which is kind of a weird blend between the two. <laughs> but yeah, it does have, um, you know, there's some business, there's psychology, there's art, kind of everything. But yeah. By the time I was done with that, I realized I really didn't want to do advertising either. Um, so, <laughs> uh, But yeah, throughout college, everyone always thought I was a CS major, even though I wasn't. Because uh, I was always tinkering with computers and doing computer-related things. Like what kind? Oh, well, I mean, from high school, I was going over to people's houses and fixing their computers or going with local businesses and setting up local networks, doing websites, like helping people around the dorm in college of fixing whatever computer issues they had. So I was kind of like the, you know, the local tech guy for a lot of people. So they just kind of assumed that I was studying computers as well. Gotcha. Uh, how did you come to work at Salesforce? So I moved to San Francisco in 2007. Uh, 2006. And then, yeah, having not had a official tech background, I, I had actually been teaching in Korea for two or for a year prior to that and wanted to kind of get back into tech or, you know, officially kind of jump into it. And my roommate happened to have a friend that was working at a little company called Salesforce, you know, met him at a dinner party and then ended up applying and joining. And I joined as part of the support team at Salesforce. And how little of a company was it back then? How long have you been at the company? Well, that was 2007. It wasn't that small, but it was smaller. It was, I, th I think, around 2,000 people total. That was when they were still trying to say that they felt like a small company, like a startup? Yeah. <laughs> I think they're still saying that. But <laughs> So, yeah, what was your early role like in support? Yeah, I was in Tier 2 basic support. So I basically dealt with all kinds of issues across the, the core product that were escalated. So we had Tier 1 that dealt with things like password resets and simple things that, that could be resolved right away. But then if anything needed to be escalated to HQ, my team dealt with that. So it was kind of all over the place, you know, from workflows not working or some case isn't, isn't operating or can't find a contact or your roles and permissions aren't correct. And then, you know, if we didn't know something, then we would escalate it up to Tier 3 and then into R&D. How did you go from being on support to building Workbench? Sure. So I was at work one day and I just noticed that there was a PHP book on my desk. At that point, I had never done any programming. Other, I had done HTML and very, very light JavaScript or you know, kind of the beginnings of that, but I had never done any programming, didn't know anything about PHP. And anyway, I brought the book home and started reading it and thought, wow, this is really interesting and got kind of like halfway through the book to kind of understand the basics and then wanted to start trying it out. I knew Salesforce had some APIs. I didn't know what those were at that point, but they seemed like they might work with this PHP thing. So I gave it a whirl and like just started from there. I started, I think, building out the describe a functionality. And then I started making a query, the little query builder that's still there today. Yeah, it just started off from there. And I started kind of using it for my job. Like, you know, a case would come in and maybe someone didn't have access to a contact or something. And I'd say, okay, well, what does this look like if I look through the API? Or maybe I need to be able to describe some object or something like that. And I was, it was really helpful in my job. So a lot of the functionality came from using it day to day. And then I would go home and then I'd build out new functionality into Workbench. And then 
kind of rinse and repeat and start to use that. And then from there, it just started to spread. Like I started using it, I shared it around to some of my coworkers. And then as cases would kind of get escalated throughout the company, someone would have a link, oh, I use this tool Workbench, you can use this here. And just more and more people started to learn about it from there. And I want to clarify, you still don't know who left the PHP book, right? I don't. I don't know who's that, who that is. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's kind of that, you know, extremely interesting set of kismet right there, that that would start to push that forward. Did you use, were there libraries at the time or anything else in PHP that you were kind of relying it on? Or is, is the early days of Workbench just really creating everything from scratch? There was the PHP toolkit, which I think it was Nick Tran made that. I think he was ahead of developer marketing at that point. Correct. So that is what a lot of the original stuff was based on. So yeah, that was definitely uh, gave a huge head start on interacting with the APIs that, that allowed me to, it kind of abstracted away all the Wizzle and SOAP stuff, at least in the early days. A lot of that's been, it's still in there actually, mm -hmm. but as it's grown out to support different APIs, uh, like the REST and metadata and other APIs, a lot of that kind of infrastructure layer has been either replaced or wrapped. But that definitely gave a, a really big head start. And what was the evolution? Because it started as it was just running like on your laptop, right? And now, it's, yep. now and, and now it's like you know hosted in the cloud. Like, what? Like, were people like asking like what your IP address was? Oh yeah, I mean, basically, I think I was just handing out my IP address to anyone, and if I like close my laptop for lunch, then people didn't have access to Workbench. Um, I mean, those were that was early days. Yeah, and then it just kind of progressed. We moved it to a VM like running in the department that anyone could access across the company. And then I think then we finally said, okay, we probably should put a domain on it, <laughs> um, an internal one. I should mention too, like from the beginning, it was all open source. It was always out there. And the official uh, installation path for anybody out in the public who wanted to use it was you know, install it on your own server. Uh, there was no hosted service at the beginning. And it wasn't until database.com came out, which if you remember was a product I don't think exists anymore, but it was basically um, Salesforce without a UI. It was the API only. Right. And it's really hard to market a product that doesn't have a UI. So Dreamforce rolled around and they needed some way to demonstrate database.com and have customers interact with it without having to write their own API clients. And Workbench you know, kind of fit the bill there because it was a UI without a, an API, without a backend, and then it just complemented database.com really well. So at that point, I was approached to make it into a like kind of semi-official service at that point. So we kind of launched the workbench.developerforce.com as a like an official demonstration of this open source project. And that's when it started to kind of make its way into some of the documentation and some of the, the demonstrations at Dreamforce and such. That's kind of when it really became official and more known to the broader world. And at that point, it was running on EC2 directly mm. in, in Amazon. I mentioned before, I'm working at Heroku now. And it was around that same, I guess it was a little bit after that, that I moved over to Heroku. And one of the first things I did was port Workbench over to Heroku. Gotcha. And so the public one is running on Heroku now. It's actually been pretty interesting. Like Workbench itself has evolved kind of over my career at Salesforce. Like mm -hmm. right at the beginning, it was like, you know, fresh programmer. And then as I started to, you know, using Workbench, I started to learn more about Apex and development in general. I started diving really deep into Java. And so you kind of see that it goes from like somebody who doesn't know at all what they're doing <laughs> to then starting to look a little bit Java-like. I start having like all these like factories and, and whatnot inside. And then when I move over to Heroku, you start to see I'm introducing a lot of like async distributed system patterns. So it's kind of interesting like, if you look through the code. There's some really horrible parts at the beginning, and then it gets kind of enterprisey, and then it gets kind of like distributed systemy, depending on kind of at what point I wrote the code. Be so. Because most developers don't have a singular repo where the commits are kind of a history of their evolution as a programmer. What do you, what do you, why wouldn't they have that? <laughs> Doesn't everybody keep something in, in uh, source well, control? Well, I think in my part, I don't have that because I don't have the attention span to pay attention to anything for so many years. Okay. <laughs> so a couple of follow-up questions on that. First of all, like day one, it being 
open source? Were you already kind of involved in the OSS community? What was what was kind of the inspiration for doing that? I think, I mean, at, at the beginning, it was a personal project. And I was doing it on my own time, and I saw no reason not to just put it out there. Yeah, so it was more, I didn't want to host code myself. Mm-hmm. So I think at that point, it was living on Google Code or some SVN something or other. I can't remember where it was. I think that was when Google Code was running SVN, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> right. And then it moved over to, to GitHub gotcha. at some point. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just, that's just my default. If I start a new project, if I don't have a good reason, I'm going to make it open source from day one. Do you remember it was like there a, a singular tipping point where you, you realized that this was no longer going to just be your personal pet project? It sounds like it was a very slow expansion, but did you have like an aha, like, oh gosh, this is like the company's going to start really looking at that. Was that just database.com or was there an earlier event? Database.com was, the, I think, the biggest kind of inflection point. Before that, it was somewhat more gradual. I would kind of keep an eye on like some of the logs of like, oh, look, it's you know being used by these people and these people and more and more orgs and more and more users. And also, I remember like just keeping track of like the downloads. That was back when it was on Google Code and you could actually view that really nicely. But um, it was pretty gradual up till that point. But I, I did, I think it was maybe probably when it went from support to the rest of the company. Like once I, I remember feeling confident enough to like include it in some email, like, hey, there's this little tool I made. Maybe you, um, you could look at it there and it might make more sense perhaps. But it was, it was pretty gradual. Nice. Do you have a favorite feature on Workbench? Favorite feature? I think one like, un, it's not very well known feature, and I think it's not enabled in the public version, it may be, but I can't remember, is the matrix Sockel view. And if you're not familiar with that, what it lets you do is when you run a Sockel query, you can also choose rows and columns that you want to display that on. So you basically get like an XY axis, and then it plots the records on the XY axis, which is a really interesting way of visualizing your data. And that actually came out of the way Google Code used to display their bugs and issues. We used to be able to say, like, maybe you put, like, the priority on the x-axis and the maybe the component on the y-axis. And then you can plot those and you can plot your issues so you can start to see, like, density graphs, kind of a scatter plot type thing of your issues. So maybe you see, oh, I have lots of, you know, P1 issues in the database or something like that. And I wanted to have something similar you could do with Salesforce records. So... That's where that came out of. So I think it's something that people probably don't use very much or know how to use. It's one of my favorites. The streaming stuff was pretty fun to work on. And maybe some of the REST Explorer stuff was kind of fun to work with as well. Yeah, I mean, I have to tell you, I owe you a huge thanks on both of those two last fronts because the lack of in platform-based UI for the, the streaming events made it very difficult to show audiences that like aha moment, you know, that's like, here's the simple demo of just like, I did this, and then in real time, it just pops up over here. And Workbench really filled that role. Uh, and the other thing I have to thank you is when I was building out the early days of the Trailhead uh, Challenge check system, one of the questions we kept trying to ask ourselves was like, well, we want to make sure that somebody crafted this page layout correctly. Is it actually possible in the REST API because we were only using REST at the time? You know, can we check for that button? Can we check that button in that section in that layout? And I was constantly getting asked that, you know, that kind of question. Maybe we'll be like, well, can we check X, Y for Z? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to go pull up Workbench. Like, I will just keep hitting, <laughs> hitting the APIs until I can give you an answer. And also, now that I've, you know, hitting the APIs, that's how the challenge checks worked, right? So it's like, I can just basically copy and paste right out of Workbench. Like, that's the format that we need to do in order to make this API check. So seriously, personally, a huge thank you because it was a tool that I don't know how I would have done specific things in my job without it. Awesome. Glad to hear that. Yeah, there's actually, on both of those features, they're used pretty heavily by internal Salesforce R&D on core, especially more and more as Salesforce, the product, becomes more and more API first. People who are building out the UIs or building out features that depend on those APIs, they're using Workbench to build that or even building out the APIs themselves. It's definitely used a ton internally. A lot of people run Workbench on their local boxes, like internal developers, and then they're hitting Salesforce running on their local machines. And then they're, you know, they can, they're creating that REST API and they hit the API and then they can view it in their browser. So I've heard similar things from other people. So it's great to hear. Excellent. Now, you're not as involved in the project these days, right? You've gone on Heroku and there are some internal teams that are 
helping support it. But once again, it's not an official Salesforce product that has official Salesforce support, correct? Correct. Yeah. So I, I'm now, as I said, at Heroku. Once I moved, I backed away from the project a lot. I will mention we actually did when we were building out Heroku Private Spaces, which is the team that I was on. We actually used Workbench a lot as our target app when we used it because it was a really great test app because it was simple enough, but then complex enough that it had, you know, there's a worker and a web and there's a Redis backend. You know, there's nothing like too crazy. It was kind of the the perfect size. It's very de- demonstrable. It was easy to like show people. People knew about it internally. So it's kind of been interesting, again, like where it kind of came up in my career at Salesforce. But yeah, I've, I've backed away from it. The uh, dev tools team is kind of maintaining and shepherding it now. It is kind of a strange, like it's status. I mentioned before, it's officially a, it is a, it's a demonstration of an open. It's an official demonstration of an open source project. Uh, You know, if you want to use it for your own purposes, you're supposed to install it yourself on your own hardware or your own Heroku instance. It's very easy. You you can, I guess that's another time when I kind of dusted it off was working with when the Heroku button was launched. Mm -hmm. So I worked on the back end of the Heroku button. If you're not familiar with that, it basically lets you like one click create a Heroku app from a template. So if you go to the Workbench repo, you can click on Deploy to Heroku, and then it should just launch on Heroku, assuming you have an account. And so you created a a Um, launch a Workbench application button? Yeah, I mean, basically, like, so my team worked on the back end of what actually happens, but then for if you have any app that you want to run on Heroku, or you want, especially you want other people to run on Heroku easily, you can create what's called a Heroku button, and all it is is you just have an app.json file that has some configuration in it that says like what are the configuration variables how what kind of dynos do you want and then anybody going to your repo can just you know mash that button and they get their own copy of the app uh, which can be really great for just like demonstration purposes or templating apps and workbench just did a that was just kind of a demonstration of that gotcha. it does sound like workbench keeps coming back into your life though it does yeah it even came back i'm working a lot with kubernetes now and a lot of the you know, when I was kind of getting my feet wet, I find the best way to like learn technology is just dive in and try it. And Workbench was there. Like, <laughs> again, it was like simple enough, but complex enough to be great to try out on Kubernetes. That was one of the first things I, I ran when I was kind of testing the waters there. Gotcha. So before we start talking about current projects, how is it that you came to go from Salesforce over to Heroku? I had just joined what was the Java Cloud team, which was a cooperation between VMware and Salesforce. And around that same time, we acquired Heroku. And basically, there was kind of competing projects there. And they kind of had the same goals. Heroku was running Java, or just starting to start running Java at that time. We were working on getting Java in the cloud with VMware. And so we decided, this doesn't make sense. Let's just join forces with Heroku. And so I joined as part of the kind of enterprise Java team at Heroku. So I remember that Dreamforce fairly clearly. And I'm just now having to have this thought that that must have been a weird event slash year for you because we announced database.com at the same Dreamforce that we announced we were acquiring Heroku. So, and those two things were completely separate, right? So that's a two huge events for you occurring almost at the exact same time. I think it was actually separated by year okay. because I think we announced the Heroku acquisition. I, d- I don't remember that they were the same year, but they probably were. That makes sense. Um, and then it wasn't until we kind of joined forces about a year after the acquisition. Got it. It wasn't like an immediate, you know, acquire and take over type right. of thing. Well, I, and, I, and I don't um, remember that Dreamforce, what we announced from database.com versus what was actually going to, you know, what was real for database, you know, what was actually working for database.com. I know there was a lot of demo where that I got to learn in about half hour. <laughs> like my first, my first demo <laughs> shift at Dreamforce, somebody's like, here are all the things that we couldn't tell you. I'm like, this will be fun. Yeah. So what are you working at, at uh, Heroku now? So currently I'm working on uh, our next generation runtime that's going to have much closer interaction with Salesforce, between Salesforce and Heroku, so that we can consume events coming in from Salesforce. So maybe like a contact is created or an account is created or whatever kind of platform event happens. And then that can then trigger code to run on the Heroku side. Very cool. All right. I only have one final question for you. What is your favorite non-technical hobby? My favorite non-technical hobby? Probably learning Korean is a big thing. I've recently started learning the piano. Kind of obsessed with that right now. 
but still very much a beginner. <laughs> a, a new instrument's a, an interesting challenge. What brought you to do that? It's my first instrument, actually. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. I had always, I always felt like I should learn music in some way. I've never been particularly musical, but uh, I always just kind of felt like programming and music and math and science, like they all kind of somehow go together in a, in a strange way. So, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying nice. it. My huge thanks to Ryan for the conversation and, of course, all of the hard work that has gone into Workbench over the years. I honestly can't even imagine how many hours it has saved people when it comes to debugging and investigating and working with features and APIs on Salesforce. Now, you might have heard a little bit of a teaser there in the form of Ryan's current work at Heroku. Uh, That was announced at Dreamforce 2019 in the form of Salesforce Evergreen. We will almost certainly be covering more of that in a future episode. If you want to hear more about this podcast, go to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast, where you can catch up on old episodes and find links to your favorite podcast services. Thank you very much for listening, and I will talk to you next week.